Of musicians active in the 2010s, it's tough to find an act with a reputation as mixed and infamous as that of Jake McElfresh. Over time, his name has become synonymous with cancelled musicians and those who are a danger to the scene. A glance at his Wikipedia page will reveal a brief history of Front Porch Step as well as some of his controversies, but these scant few lines of text fail to showcase the depth and severity of his transgressions throughout his career. So who is Jake McElfresh, and what made him fall so hard? Jake began writing and releasing music under the name Front Porch Step in 2012, starting with Endearment EP on April 2nd, followed by So Help Me God just a few months later. Hailing from Newark, Ohio, Jake's upbringing consisted of country music and acoustic guitars. His love for music and the fact no one wanted to be in a band with him are reasons he cites for starting Front Porch Step. In August 2012, Jake would release his first hit, Island of the Misfit Boy. Shortly after its release, the song garnered roughly 100,000 views on YouTube. American punk rock label Pure Noise Records took note of his success and signed with him August of 2013. In an article regarding his signing with Pure Noise, Jake states, I am both excited and humbled to be given this opportunity. I don't think I could have picked a better stable of artists to be involved with, let alone a better person to represent me, than Jake Round. I am very excited to get this album out to my fans, and I look forward to the future. On November 12th, 2013, he dropped his first LP, Aware. The album contained 11 acoustic tracks teeming with bitterness and anger, and people loved it. They latched onto it immediately. As soon as Aware came out, everyone in the scene was talking about it. I remember people in my local scene discussing him and his music ad nauseum, accompanied by the fact you couldn't go on Tumblr without seeing a lyric edit for Drown. Many appreciated and connected with his no-holds-barred approach to lyricism, saying whatever was on his mind. Um, very, very brutally honest lyrics, um, which either will make you absolutely hate it or maybe love it uh, if I get lucky. That summer, he would be asked to play all 42 dates of the Vans Warped Tour, a traveling rock festival catering to teens and young adults. A successful Warped Tour run can often change an artist's life, and for Jake, it did just that. This experience would multiply his fan base while also growing his connections within the music industry. Come fall, he'd go out on the Pure Noise Records tour with Rising Act's State Champs, Handguns, and Forever Came Calling. In the midst of announcing his next tour, he also announced his next project, Whole Again EP, slated to release December 2nd, 2014. From the outside looking in, he had it all. An enraptured fanbase, a supportive record label, tour offers, and new music on the way. But Jake's world as he knew it was about to change forever. In total, there were four major testimonies made against Jake McElfresh of Front Porch Step. During this period, tensions got so high, he reluctantly went on Billboard.com to discuss the issue. The article states, accompanied by his publicist and manager, an uneasy McElfresh confirms to Billboard that he engaged in lewd text conversations with 16 and 17 year olds. He also admits that he exchanged nude photos with women under 18, but he vehemently denies ever having sex with anyone under 18, and none of the accusers dispute that. But even this admission to guilt serves to minimize what went on between him and his victims. The testimonies and text conversations reveal a dark, troubled man with manipulative tendencies and a desire to control. Jake describes himself as not the most attractive dude in the world. He's also admitted to having trouble with women in the past, from being cheated on to lied to. This should be taken into account when trying to comprehend how he ended up making the decisions he did. No. Um, this girl blatant, this girl messed with my mind, just uh, told me she loved me. Uh, we've been friends, we were friends, we're not anymore, we were friends for seven years. Uh, told me she loved me, but would say all these things like, you know, I love you, but we're, we're just two good friends, I can't be with you. 
Like, we're just too good of friends. Posted on December 30th, 2014, this girl states her first contact with Miguel Fresh was made February 2014. She tweeted at him saying all she wanted for her birthday was for Jake to sing to her. She tweeted this at him the day of her birthday in which she had just turned 16. He immediately DM'd her, they exchanged numbers, and he called to sing her happy birthday. They had little to no contact until the following month on March 29th at Mixtape Festival. Here's the abridged piece of text she wrote about her experience there and with Jake overall. I left Mixtape Festival rather early because my cousin had got punched in the face and she had a bloody nose. Upon arriving back at my house, I got a DM from Jake McElfresh. He asked if I was still at the Mixtape Festival. I told him no and I remember he replied with a frowny face. I asked him why he was frowning and he told me it was because he was going to ask if I wanted to go out and drink with him and his friends. He asked how old I was and once I told him I was 16, he stopped talking to me. May 2014, he began talking to me all over again as if he never ignored me. He would call me over 10 times a day and we'd have conversations that lasted longer than two hours. He told me about all of his sex experiences. He always wanted to have phone sex and that was something I was never comfortable with. Our conversations were always sexual, but I romanticized this gross notion inside of my head that Jake McElfresh genuinely liked me the way I liked him. I called Jake once when I was having a panic attack and he helped me a lot. He started talking to me less, but he would call me at really late hours of the night when he was masturbating and it started to scare me. I told my mom about him in the past and she agreed to let him stay at our house when he came to New York for Warp Tour. During their time communicating, Jake sent at least two photos of his genitals along with a slew of disturbing sexual messages. When he came to New York for Warp Tour, he said he was coming down with a cold and refused to go to IHOP with me because my mom was going to be there. My mom honestly didn't care because she didn't know the sexual aspect of our relationship, but I think the true reason was because I had a best friend at the time named Zach who Jake absolutely despised. Jake cursed me out on a phone call because I told Zach about us and accused me of cheating on him when we were never even dating. I stopped talking to guys because I was so committed to Jake when he didn't even feel a thing for me. I hung up on him and he called me back a total of 46 times. At Warp Tour, Jake kept telling me to ditch my best friend Zach and go into his tour bus to have sex with him. He said it would have to be quick, but he'd make it worth it. We stopped talking. We would still talk occasionally. I would text him wishing him a happy Halloween, a happy Thanksgiving, only to get no answer. The last time we talked, he was sad. He told me his girlfriend broke up with him. This time, I didn't answer. I honestly thought I was different and I try to find humor in this, but there is none. Jake McElfresh degraded me. I may just be one voice, but there are so many others. We need to stop him while we're still given the chance. This next testimony was posted around the same time as the last, late December 2014. This one is much more extensive in terms of text message evidence. In this, Jake displays manipulative behavior, threatening suicide if his demands aren't met. It was February 2014, somewhere in the early 20s, I can't remember the exact date. It was the Acoustic Basement Tour, with transit headlining. I showed up early as I always do with one of my best friends. We stood outside the venue in the frigid winter air, awaiting doors. A man opened the door and said, are you here for the show? I said yes. He then asked who I was there to see, and I responded, front porch step. He laughed and said, that's me, you know. I'd never seen what he looked like, for I did not care. It was the music I was there for. This interaction has become my deepest regret. The next day at school, he followed me and quickly DM'd me, hey. A normal, friendly conversation emerged, and we talked for a few days. March 1st, he DM'd me. I was with my friends. We talked, a little more personally. He gave me his number, constantly asking if it was weird that he had done so. I didn't think it was, so we talked all night and for a few days. 
That first night, I asked him if he had a job outside of music, and he joked with me and said he had some sort of webcam business. I was confused. Then he called me for the first time, later to become hundreds. I ran up to my room for privacy, and this is where it truly began. We talked for weeks. He was really sweet and respectful during this time, but that changed very quickly and suddenly. Everything I did, he controlled. Things I tweeted, I was in trouble for. I was scared to talk to him because some conversations would turn into wars over one mere word. I understand that he had a hard life and his mental state was obviously unstable, but what he put me through was undeserving. Fights ended with a threat to himself and I didn't know what to do beyond doing anything he'd ask. I didn't see any of this as an issue at the time. After we broke up, we'd talk occasionally. He'd say he missed me and talk as if nothing was wrong. Just as with the other girl, at Warp Tour, he texted me. We hadn't talked in months, but sure enough, he was asking me to go to his bus and lay with him in his bunk. Later in the day, he saw my friends, signed a map with the nickname he knew I hated, and told them to tell me to go to his tent after his set. I waited in line with all his fans eager to meet him, nearly in tears. He exclaimed, how are you, hugged me, took a photo, and told me I had to go. I remember the next day we spoke, I told him I had plans to go to the CT date as well, and he acted excited. He asked me if I wanted him that day. A few days later, I went to the Connecticut Warp Tour, mainly so I could talk to him, as I never got a chance to in Massachusetts. He was sick and went to bed after his set. I saw him on the way to his bus. He hugged me and looked almost scared of me. A week or two later, he texted me and said he started dating one of his best friends and that he hoped I'd be happy for him and we could be friends. I said I was happy for him, but I was confused as to why he'd tell me this so suddenly. A little less than a month later, he was in the Boston area for a signing and performance at the South and North Shore Malls at Tilly's. He called me at 2am two days before and told me he was in a hotel in a town north of Boston. I remember he asked me what I would do if I were there. This time, I did not participate. I changed the subject and asked him why he was calling me. He hung up, texted me, and told me not to go to his show. I was working, so I couldn't, nor did I want to. He never responded. That was the last time I talked to him, though I did see him in October at the Pure Noise tour. There are so many messages I can't get myself to scroll through to find the most brutal of fights. What I've included is only what I could get myself to look at again. I'm sorry this is so long, I don't know how else to tell my story. There is more of course, I just can't tell it all. It's too much. At this point, public opinion of Jake had begun to sour, but it wouldn't reach its apex until July 2015. The following testimony was submitted anonymously after the victim read the first two stories and felt the need to speak out. She details how Jake willingly cheated on his of-age girlfriend with her. In March of 2014, when I was 15, me and my friends drove up to one of Jake's shows. I bought a sweatshirt from him and he shook my hand and was very sweet. We talked very briefly, I felt like he was being flirty, but maybe I was just being hopeful or conceited. A few days later, he followed me back on Twitter, and then he gave me his phone number. He told me to call him real quick and not to tell anyone, so I did. He said that I was a great girl and that I could call him anytime I needed to talk. About a week later, my parents got into an awful fight and I called him sobbing. After I calmed down, he started asking me sexual questions. He got more and more sexual until one night I called him and he asked me to have phone sex with him. This continued for a while and he also sent me nudes. But he also started to make me feel bad about my problems, and it felt like he only talked to me when he was horny. When my city's warped state rolled around, I went to see him at his booth. I hugged him and he said he'd hit me up later. A few days later, he texted me and told me that he had met up with an old friend and that he really liked her and he hoped that I could be happy for him. He started to date this beautiful girl who was his age, but he kept coming on to me. He cheated on his girlfriend with me multiple times up until about September, and then he just completely stopped talking to me. And then, the posts started to blow up. I saw all these different posts, with proof. I immediately texted him and screamed at him and asked if it was true. 
he denied it. He told me that he had a sex addiction and that the only thing he was guilty of was being a womanizer. The next day when I read through the stories, I felt sick. I felt manipulated and taken advantage of and completely dirty. This is why I'm sharing my story, but I'm sharing it anonymously because I have seen the backlash that the other brave young women received. After these allegations surfaced, some musicians began speaking out, with Allison Weiss dropping her upcoming tour with him. To make matters worse, during the time Jake spent conversing with underage girls, he also had a real-life steady girlfriend. Her name was Autumn Lavis. They met in December 2013 at one of his shows, where she bought a copy of his album. The following September, she packed up and moved to Ohio with him after meeting a handful of times. She states, When things were good, they were incredible. But when they were bad, they were really, really awful. Jake would always feel jealous even though she never cheated on him, to the point of pushing away all of her guy friends. He would make all her decisions for her and sometimes wouldn't even let her drive her car. When Jake went on the Pure Noise tour, she charged his old phone and went through it. In it, she found photos from women aging 16 to 36. Jake cheated on her a total of 19 times while they were together. While there was no evidence to suggest he did anything physically with these girls, he did make plans to. After confronting Jake with the evidence and threatening to leave to Arizona, he begs her to stay. He stood in the mirror and then looked at me deranged and screamed that he was ugly and that no one would be with him. The look that was in his eyes haunts me. A few days later, she packed her bags and moved to Arizona with her grandparents. As public ire toward Front Porch Step was growing, Jake responded by making a lengthy Facebook post and entering a sex addict treatment program. During this time, he put all current tour plans on hold, including his spot on the 2015 Vans Warp Tour. But during this time, he still kept in touch with Autumn. Part of Jake's therapy treatment was that he wasn't allowed to have any romantic relationships for a year. But after being released from treatment, Autumn says he relapsed right away, hooking up and having intercourse, texting people, and repeating the same behavior with no change. She eventually got in contact with Kevin Lyman, founder of Warp Tour, to let him know the situation. Autumn says Kevin dismissed the issue, saying, Jake's in therapy. The choice to include Front Porch Step on the 2015 Nashville date was met with major backlash from the community. You don't know shit about me. The difference between you and me is I know who I am and I fucking am very proud of that. So you go ahead and sit and watch my set. Thank you very much. Thanks for the ticket money, dude. Appreciate it. As news of the situation began to spread, those upset shifted their gaze toward Warp Tour's founder, Kevin Lyman. If there was any speck of danger to anyone out there, it wouldn't have happened, tour producer Kevin Lyman tells Billboard. Lyman asserts no one was harmed or at risk at the show. I have two daughters, 16 and 20 out there. Do you think I would ever put them in danger? He adds, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't accept someone asking to give someone a hand up. The easy decision would have been to say, fuck you, Jake, I'm not helping anymore. I've had 13 death threats so far. It wasn't a rash decision, it was just an unpopular one. But Kevin's comments did little to persuade public opinion of Jake and the decision to include him at the Nashville date. It also didn't help that Jake attempted to sue his ex-girlfriend Autumn Lavis, claiming she ruined his image. On August 3rd, 2015, Jake requested to drop the case, effectively wasting everyone's time. Following these events, Jake stayed quiet. Many thought he was done with music forever, but public opinion and scrutiny didn't stop him from releasing a new album on March 31st, 2017, titled I Never Loved before I found you. The project served as somewhat of an apology, making vague references to past events without directly addressing what happened. To this day, Front Porch Step is technically an active music project, with Jake releasing a new track this year, 
you look nothing like my dreams. However, it's unlikely he'll ever regain his once enraptured fan base. Front Porch Step serves as an example of what can happen when a person with the wrong mindset and attitude is afforded the limelight. His career could be viewed as a step-by-step -step playbook on how not to conduct yourself in the music industry. His downfall illustrates how quick a position of power can become a tool to sow yourself a negative fate and the everlasting impact of those decisions. Thank you for watching.